can you all hear me okay? You got it? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Rachel Alexander. I'm the Associate Director of New America California. And we're, really, we're really pleased to be hosting this event today um, with David Wallace Wells and with Autumn McDonald here at the beautiful Bloomberg Beta space. So I think we're going to have someone come in from Bloomberg Beta to give you a little bit of an orientation to the space and to address you uh, about you know the company. But before that starts, um, I need to kick us off. So uh, I think like, like many of you, I have been thinking a lot lately about climate change. Um, and in fact, in my case, thinking a lot about it is putting it pretty lightly. <laughs> uh, recently, my wife and I heard an advertisement for an NPR special in which a panel of psychologists would be counseling people on how to manage their climate-related anxiety. And uh, my wife was listening, and she kind of shot me a sidelong glance, and she said, maybe we should tune into that. <laughs> she said it really gently, and she's wonderfully sensitive to my feelings in general. Um, so she said we, you know, but I knew she really meant me, because I'm the one who regularly keeps her up at night um, talking about polar bears and talking about climate refugees, and especially talking about our son, who's a toddler, um, and the world that he's going to. So my climate anxiety, to be honest, is, is pretty much ever-present. It's like a low simmer uh, that is quick to boil over when I read particularly troubling news. Uh, the panic reared its head most recently on the day I read the article from the Harvard climate adaptation expert who identified cities near the Great Lakes as the most ideal locations for people like us, us West Coasters, who would need to be fleeing these intensifying fires. Uh, did you all see that article? That one really got to me. Um, that night when my wife came home from work, it was the only thing I wanted to talk about. Um, we just dropped everything, I told her, forget trying to find a house in California. We are moving to Minnesota. Uh, the next day, though, I got a much needed reality check um, in a rebuttal I read from writer Lindy West. So what she wrote is, to be clear, are we just breezily submitting to dystopia here? And her point was that, Humanity can still take action to avert major elements of climate catastrophe. And this move to Minnesota mentality uh, that I am so prone to actually speaks to a pretty paralyzing hopelessness um, that not only feels really terrifying to experience, but is also the surest way to guarantee that we do experience the worst of what a warming world could bring. So to be clear, I do think that there is value in helping people, especially the most vulnerable people, plan for adapting to the changes that are already underway. But leaving the conversation simply at, let's move to Duluth, can feel deeply disempowering. As an alternative, we must have faith that humanity will take the steps necessary to stem climate change, and to let that faith fuel our personal and collective action. Our charge, as you're going to hear David articulate today, is to stay engaged with the truth without getting paralyzed by the challenge that it presents. This work of translating feelings into action is something that New America California cares a lot about. We promote problem-solving efforts that are locally grown and grounded in economic equity, in which technology, innovation, and compelling storytelling yield transformative solutions for our most marginalized community members. One of the ways that we do that is through gatherings and events like this one that help Californians take action on our state's most pressing issues. When it comes to climate change, we at New America California are particularly concerned with its equity implications, like how it will disproportionately impact people living in poverty, how it could undermine people's ability to have voice and self-determination in our democracy, how it could grow the racial inequalities that are already stifling opportunity in communities across our state. Our director at New America California, Autumn McDonald, who's going to moderate our discussion today, recently published a piece about how to turn feelings of overwhelm into productive action. And this is one reason I'm particularly glad that she's leading the conversation with David today. Autumn brings two decades of social impact experience, leading partnerships with foundations, nonprofits, and government. Before joining New America, she served as a senior advisor to San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee, focusing on women's economic empowerment and shaping policies, programs, and public-private initiatives to improve economic and social opportunities for women and families throughout the Bay Area. So as you listen to Autumn and David today, I encourage that you not move to Minnesota just yet and avoid the temptation of tuning out or giving up. We cannot change what we do not first accept 
Fear and paralysis might be way stations, but we must continue through them on the journey to transforming our climate future. And David has some pretty good ideas about how to do that. So before I pass the mic over to Autumn, um, I'm going to pass it first to Malia from Bloomberg. We'll give you a welcome to the space. Thank you. Sorry, we're doing the reverse, I guess. Um, good afternoon. My name is Malia Simons, and I lead Bloomberg's philanthropy and engagement here on the U.S. West Coast. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our offices today. As many of you know, Bloomberg is a media and technology company that provides data, news, and analytics around government, finance, and business to our customers. And it's through this global business that we're able to fund Bloomberg Philanthropies, an umbrella organization that covers, encompasses all of Mike Bloomberg's charitable activities, including corporate giving, foundation initiatives, and um, his personal contributions. One of our focus areas, and an area that Mike cares deeply about, is the environment. It sounds vague and broad and rather undefined, but it's a little bit by design. We want to be able to help as many people around the world as possible with keeping our funding strategy nimble. So for example, Mike recently committed again to fill the funding gap um, that was left by the US federal government so that the UN can continue to empower countries to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Um, speaking of Paris, last year we produced a film called From Paris to Pittsburgh that highlights the solutions that um, Americans are demanding and developing um, in the face of climate change. And we're happy that we've held over 200 grassroots screening of this film across the country. And on a very local level, during Earth Month, Bloomberg employees around the globe volunteered with environmental stewardship projects like planting trees, cleaning shorelines, and recycling drives to bring sustainability awareness to their home communities. These are just a few and varied ways that Bloomberg Philanthropies is raising awareness and encouraging action against climate change. However, if everyone read just a few excerpts from David Wallace Wells' book, they'd understand pretty quickly how important our environment truly is and that we are pressed for time. So, without a moment to waste, um, we should probably get today's program started. Um, here you go. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Great. So, I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm thrilled to be having this conversation with you, um, with all of us, uh, because when, I would say when I read your book, but when you read your book to me via Audible, <laughs> on my drive to work and other places, um, I was terrified, just frankly terrified. And as I like to consider you like our cousin, and as a national, New American National Fellow, we have New American California Fellows as our cousin fellow, um, I'm intrigued by what led you to read this, to write this book. Mostly because I know that you say uh, you weren't an environmentalist to start with, you weren't, you know, born a tree hugger. So what led you to say this is something that I should be writing about? Well, I, um, the short answer is that I started to see how much climate change would impact my life and the life of people that I knew and loved, even if all of them lived in the urban fortress of New York City. So I am a um, lifelong New Yorker. I felt, you know, walking those streets that I was living up until a few years ago, that I was sort of living outside of the forces of nature. And while I knew about climate change, was concerned about it, um, had some worries about how it was being managed, I also didn't understand that it was um, an all-encompassing story, um, that it would impact your life no matter where you lived or how rich you were or what country you were from, um, and that the impacts would be quite universal and dramatic and profound. Um, I had that revelation sort of not with any particular paper not with any particular news event, but sometime in the course of the fall of 2016, seeing much more um, coverage of climate in the academic publications that I kept an eye on and some parts of the internet that also sort of focused on um, projecting our near-term futures, but also that that news that I was getting from those sources um, was much, much more alarming than I saw reflected in publications. I'm, I'm a 
by day a magazine editor of publications that I thought of as my competitors, um, and which I saw most of my colleagues getting their news from. So when I read about climate change in the New York Times or the Washington Post, or when I heard about it, saw it covered on television news, um, it was in terms that I didn't recognize from what I understood and knew about the science as it was emerging and evolving. And honestly, my you know I had a kind of flicker of fear. Part of my response to that news was fear about my future and the future of the planet and the species. But I also just had a simple storytelling impulse as a journalist that there was a real gap between um, just how dramatic and all-encompassing and severe this crisis was, um, as it was understood by the world's scientists, and how that story had been told to this point by the world's storytellers. Um, I, you know, I had a came at it from a particular angle um, as someone who felt not just distant from, but in certain ways alienated from the environmental movement most of my life. Um, I wanted the planet to be clean and um, ecosystems to thrive, but they were not especially important to me as someone who lived my whole life in a city, um, just raised the way that I was. I never had a pet. You know, I didn't have my emotional um, triggers triggered by um, animal stories. And yeah, I, I, um, I just sort of started to realize that um, that was not, that didn't mean that climate change wasn't coming for me. And um, it also opened up a whole area of inquiry, or really sets of inquiries, that seem to most people writing about climate and thinking about climate, I think, sort of secondary, which is to say most activists, advocates, and climate journalists really were focused on direct climate impacts, what kind of sea level we could expect, how fast the Arctic was melting in the, melting in the Antarctic. And in part because I was seeing all of this new research into things like economic impacts, which could mean a global GDP that's 30% smaller than it would be without climate change by the end of the century. It's an impact that's twice as deep as the Great Depression, um, or impacts on conflict, which could mean twice as much war as we have today, um, to public health and agriculture. Um, it just seemed to me to be a much bigger story than we had been told before, and that it would show up outside of the realm of science, in the realm of politics, in the realm of geopolitics, in the realm of culture and storytelling, and um, how we related to economics and how we related to technology. Um, and I thought that those areas had really not been undertaken, had not really been thought seriously about, um, certainly not in a broad, mainstream public way. And I thought because the conversation about climate was moving so quickly, it also offered an opportunity to expand the aperture of that conversation to include some of these downstream effects, which I think in the end may turn out to be just as profound and just as dramatic as the direct climate ones. It's interesting because you mentioned this piece about you know you didn't go up in the pen in the pen, the, mm -hmm. the animal side of it, or like the loving of kind of nature and thinking about kind of what happens there. And it brings up for me this question of what is the true like distinction, if there is one, between kind of just generally environmentally friendly practices and trying to slow, and I won't say you know reverse but slow climate change. And I'll give you an example, which is that like, you know, you think about, you know, don't, you know, save, save the pelicans or save, you know, keep, make sure there's not, um, you know, oil on the baby whales and all of these different things versus how do we actually like carbon footprint and making sure that there's actually not sea level rise and all that. So can you help us determine the distinction? I don't know who's here in the room, but like for those of us who aren't necessarily as adept, what are, what is the distinction in your mind, or how would you explain it? Yeah, I mean, um, the global warming issue is a carbon issue. It's about how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. Um, there are natural cycles that are um, that complicate that story a little bit, but the main driver of climate change is how much carbon humans put into the air. And um, so anything that has to do with that is a climate issue. Mm -hmm. Anything which has to do with uh, carbon production is a climate issue. And um, the whole suite of things that are not related to carbon, I think of as sort of separate, environmentally um, valuable to the extent that we want to preserve ecosystems and in certain ways sometimes connected to um, the carbon cycle. But generally, um, I'm someone who thinks, you know, if the world had, if we had to lose 
some significant chunk of the world's species um, to stabilize the temperature of the planet, that probably would be worth it. Um, and I think that in balancing these these um, these different imperatives, um, I think that like carbon rapid decarbonization is overwhelmingly more important than really anything else that we've learned or been told was environmentally important for um, a few decades. Mm -hmm. And that's because, you know, climate change is, I mentioned earlier, it's an all-encompassing story. It is, um, it changes the cognitive performance of individuals. It changes, um, you know, uh, rates of um, mental illness. It changes, um, violence between individuals. So you have higher murder rates and um, rape figures when temperatures are higher. And um, additionally, the impacts on ecosystems and animal life are quite dramatic too. So if you care about the well-being of animals, it's probably more important to reduce our carbon footprint than it is to be make, make a more targeted, um, uh, you know, have more targeted responses to particular ecosystems, even those that are in distress. And I think that that is a kind of a good analogy to the way that we think about um, this issue in our politics, which is to say, we can care about many, many things when we worry about the future politically. We can care about you know, um, economic growth and income inequality. We can care about conflict and violence against women. We can care about um, global justice issues. Um, and yet, in a certain way, all of those are not just impacted, but perhaps even governed by um, the climate, in that when the climate is destabilized, all of those different um, concerns will be transformed and in most ways um, made worse. And so while I think there are, for anyone who has a kind of um, progressive disposition towards the world, there are a huge number of things that we should be doing, huge num you know, politically, to make things better. It's also the case that global warming hovers over all of it. As a kind of as the meta narrative of our time, and if we don't address it, it makes addressing any one of those individual challenges um, much much harder. It's the same with animals. You know, if we end up at a planet that's four degrees warmer, um, you know, there won't be any hope for the pelicans. Um, there won't be any hope for the whales. I mean, already the World Wildlife Fund says that 60% of the world's vertebrate mammals have died since 1970, and many um, entomologists believe that we have lost as much as half of insect biomass over the last few decades, too. Um, so we're already living through a mass extinction that is punishing the world's animals. Um, but even so, I think the most important thing is for us to focus on the problem of carbon and the problem of global temperature, um, whether we're focused on the plight of animals or the f plight of humans, um, the sort of the prerogative, the imperative, to me, is very clear. Can you talk about how so many of these issues will be exacerbated by what's going on I would love to hear you tell us kind of a two-minute version. Obviously, you cannot in any way note down this amazing book in yeah. two minutes. But like the, the version for like a five-year-old, like how do you explain to a five-year-old the two minutes of like what's at stake? What's going on here? Um, for a five-year-old, okay. So um, uh, the air is, you know, the air is composed of a variety of different kinds of gases. We see it as um, a single thing, but it's actually quite complicated. One of those is um, carbon dioxide. And one thing that carbon dioxide does is makes the Earth a little warmer. That's because it, um, it's like a little blanket. It's kind of like a, a blanket in the atmosphere that keeps whatever heat is in the planet there rather than dissipating up into, the, into outer space. The more carbon we have in the atmosphere, the hotter the planet will get. And because of the carbon that we've put into the atmosphere over the last couple of hundred years, but really especially over the last 30 years, um, the planet is already hotter than it has ever been in the entire history of humanity. Um, so that means that you and I are walking a planet that is warmer than any planet walked by any human before. Um, that means that it's kind of an open question whether humans would have ever evolved in a planet that was always this warm. I think they would have, but um, it's conceivable that they wouldn't have. And a much more pressing open question whether we would have ever developed agriculture and farming and through that civilization under conditions like this, because the places where we did invent farming and civilization, the Middle East, 
already gotten a lot harder to grow crops. Um, so, so much harder that it's not certain to me that people would have been able to do that from scratch under these conditions. More generally, everything that we know of as human history, by which I mean not just the 10,000 years since um, the beginning of civilization, but the entire biological history of the species, has been conducted under a very particular set of temperature conditions. Um, we, everything we know of as civilization and know of as history was conducted in this window of temperatures, which we are now outside of. Um, and that means that we can't necessarily take for granted that those features that we thought of as permanent features of human life can or will be able to endure and continue in the way that we've assumed they would for a very long time. And we are adaptable. We know how to invent our way out of problems. And there are a lot of reasons for hope and optimism in this story. But we are literally outside of um, the laboratory in which the entire human experiment has been conducted. It's sort of as though we've landed on a new planet with a completely different set of rules than the one that we grew up learning and responding to. And we need to develop new tools and new responses um, to make that new planet livable for all of us. So I mentioned earlier that uh, I have been listening on Audible, as you read it very well. Yeah. <laughs> I would love if you would read just a short passage to yeah. us. Um, this is from the beginning of the book, so it shouldn't require too much. Um, much intro. Or maybe not. <clears throat> Many perceive global warming as a sort of moral and economic debt accumulated since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and now come due after several centuries. In fact, more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been emitted in just the past three decades which means that we have, done, we have done as much damage to the fate of the planet and its ability to sustain human life and civilization since Al Gore published his first book on climate than in all the centuries, all the millennia that came before. The United Nations established its climate change framework in 1992, advertising scientific consensus unmistakably to the world. This means we have now engineered as much ruin, knowingly, as we ever managed in ignorance. Global warming may seem like a distended morality tale playing out over several centuries and inflicting a kind of Old Testament retribution on the great-great-grandchildren of those responsible. <clears throat> Since it was carbon burning in 18th century England that lit the fuse of everything that has followed. But that is a fable about historical villainy that acquits those of us alive today and unfairly. The majority of the burning has come since the premiere of Seinfeld. Since the end of World War II, the figure is about 85%. The story of the industrial world's kamikaze mission is the story of a single lifetime. The planet brought from seeming stability to the brink of catastrophe in the years between a baptism or bar mitzvah and a funeral. We all know those lifetimes. When my father was born in 1938, among his first memories, the news of Pearl Harbor and the mythic Air Force of the industrial propaganda films that followed. The climate system appeared, to most human observers, steady. Scientists had understood the greenhouse effect, had understood the way carbon produced by burned wood and coal and oil could hothouse the planet and disequilibrate, disequilibrate everything on it for three quarters of a century. But they had not yet seen the impact, not really, not yet which made warming seem less like an observed fact than a dark prophecy, to be fulfilled only in a very distant future, perhaps never. By the time my father died in 2016, weeks after the desperate signing of the Paris Agreement, the climate system was tipping towards devastation, passing the threshold of carbon concentration, 400 parts per million, that had been, for years, the bright red line environmental scientists had drawn in the rampaging face of modern industry, saying, do not cross. Of course, we kept going. Just two years later, we hit a monthly average of 411, and guilt saturates the planet's air as much as carbon, though we choose to believe we do not breathe it. <clears throat> 
The single, <clears throat> the single lifetime is also the lifetime of my mother, born in 1945 to German Jews fleeing the smokestacks through which their relatives were incinerated, and now enjoying her 73rd year <clears throat> in an American commodity paradise, a paradise supported by the factories of a developing world that has, in the space of a single lifetime too, manufactured its way into the global middle class with all the consumer enticements and fossil fuel privileges that come with that ascent. Electricity, private cars, air travel, red meat. She has been smoking for 58 of those years, unfiltered, ordering the cigarettes now by the carton from China. It is also the lifetime of many of the scientists who first raised public alarm about climate change, some of whom incredibly remain working. That is how rapidly we have arrived at this promontory. Roger Revell, who first heralded the heating of the planet, died in 1991. But Wallace Smith Broker, he's actually no longer alive. He died since the book was published. But Wallace Smith Broker, who helped popularize the term global warming, still drives to work at the Lamont Doratory Earth Observatory across the Hudson every day from the Upper West Side, sometimes picking up lunch at an old Jersey filling station recently outfitted as a hipster eatery. In the 1970s, he did his research with funding from Exxon, a company now the target of a raft of lawsuits that aim to adjudicate responsibility for the rolling emissions regime that today, barring a change of course on fossil fuels, threatens to make parts of the planet more or less unlivable by, for humans by the end of this century. That is the course we are speeding so blithely along to more than four degrees Celsius of warming by the year 2100. According to some estimates, that would mean that whole regions of Africa and Australia and the United States, parts of South America north of Patagonia, and Asia south of Siberia would be rendered uninhabitable by direct heat, desertification, and flooding. Certainly, it would make them inhospitable, and many more regions besides. This is our itinerary, our baseline, which means that if the planet was brought to the brink of climate catastrophe within the lifetime of a single generation, the responsibility to avoid it belongs with a single generation too. We all know that second lifetime. It is ours. So that noise I just made that whew, was the same thing I did as I was listening with my earphones and doing like six other things. I love that you mention your, your mother and your father because uh, you take us personal for a moment. And if you're willing, I'd like to go even more personal. I know there's another point in the book where you talk about having kids and your role as a father and Waka, who is one, right? Um, so I also, as the parent of three kids, six, four, and two, think a lot about this. And so my question to you is, what is the, the ray of hope? Um, what is the, in your mind, the, the thought of it will be okay, or are we all indeed screwed? Uh, well, I, it's a co really complicated question to answer, and I think, to be completely honest, I think part of how I've thought about having a child is simply a reflection of the fact that I, like everybody else on this planet, is live, I live through compartmentalization and denial about climate change as well. Um, but to the extent that I thought more rigorously about the problem um, in going through the process of having a, a child. Um, what I came to are two or three really big thoughts, which I think are not just important on the question of child rearing, but on the question of um, how much hope we can have for the future. And the first is, um, I think, politically and in every other way, it's important for us to fight for the kind of world that we want to have, for the kind of lives we want to be able to lead um, for ourselves and for those we love rather than giving up before the story is over. Um, and I think that even when you understand, the second thing is even when you understand just how dramatic some of these impacts could be, that we could have agricultural yields that are half as bountiful as they are today, um, you know, that there would be places in the planet hit by six climate-driven natural disasters at once, $600 trillion in global climate damages by the end of the century, which is double all the wealth that exists in the world today. Um, you realize that those impacts, as horrifying and scary as they are, are actually reflections of our power over the climate and over the planet. If they happen, 
They will happen because we bring them into being by making choices from here on out. Um, and that means that we can make different choices. You know, as I mentioned earlier when talking to the five-year-old, um, you know, the main driver of climate change is how much carbon we put into the atmosphere. Our hands are on those levers. Um, we can determine how much we do. Hopefully, in short order, we can put zero into the atmosphere. Um, but if we don't, it will be our responsibility. This is not a story that is outside of our control. It is a story that is in our hands. And that power, you know, some people find it a little overwhelming. It's, a, it's the kind of power we really only used to see in mythology and theology. But we truly do hold the fate of the world and the species in our hands. And we can choose to behave responsibly in a way that will secure a more prosperous and fulfilling future. Or we can make other choices. Um, but it's all up to us. Um, and given that, and given that everything we know about the state of the planet, the scale of the planet, resources, um, knowing that it can sustain a bigger human population than the one that we have today if we manage that development properly. Um, I think of having a child as a kind of investment in that future rather than um, uh, in, an imposition of cost, um, a carbon imposition on the future, although it is that too. But the most important thing to keep in mind um, is, for me, that you know climate change is not a binary thing. It's not a matter of is it here or not. It's not a matter of have we passed the threshold of catastrophe or not. Um, Every tick upward of temperature will make many of these impacts worse. Um, every tick upward that we can avoid will make them less intense. And you know that means that it will, while in a certain way I think it'll, it is already too late to avoid, say, two degrees of warming, which is the level of warming that most scientists describe as the threshold of catastrophe, and many islands of the na island nations of the world call genocide. Um, it will never be too late to make the future climate of the planet better. Um, or worse, even if we end up at four or five degrees, which I think would be quite hellish, we will still be able to engineer the climate of the decade following, making that better for human flourishing or worse. Um, and I hope that I raise my child, I hope we all raise all of our children to have that perspective in mind, because I suspect that we will have considerably more warming. Um, as I said earlier, I think, um, I don't think there's much chance we'll stay below two degrees of warming. Um, this century, I would say, I guess that we end up somewhere at the high end of the two degree, the three degree range. Um, but I would like that the people who were alive then to not think, well, the game's over. We might as well just retreat into self-interest and um, uh, narcissism. Um, because there will be people in other parts of the world who are suffering quite intensely. Um, global warming is a universal story, but it also punishes unequally. And I would like my child, and I hope all of our children, to be raised with enough empathy that the suffering of those in places like India and Bangladesh, for instance, um, would really count in their sense of the state of the world and its well-being, and would really motivate them to take actions to alleviate some of that suffering, both in the immediate term in the sense of being more generous with um, those in the world who are most in need, but also in the longer term, um, taking more aggressive action to secure a more stable, prosperous, fulfilling future for everyone. Um, and I think if we find ourselves in a mindset of, you know, we have to avoid two degrees or else we're lost, which is a kind of emerging narrative on the environmental left, um, although I support everything, you know, almost everything they're doing, it's, um, I think that's really dangerous because I don't think there's any chance that we're going to stay below two degrees. Um, so the story of how we adapt and mitigate and um, develop ways of living in that new world, I think, is um, as important as marshalling all the resources we can to slow the pace of warming and ideally stop it um, relatively soon. So I have a few more questions, but I wanted to make sure those of you in the audience uh, note that those cards in front of you and those pencils are for you to write any questions that you have so that when I finish my questions, in a matter of minutes, um, you can Pass those forward or pass those to Rakova, and I, I can um, share those with David. So, to the point you said, our hand is on the lever, and that really resonated with me. Um, it actually reminded me of just the other night when I was watching, maybe it was in the Daily Show or some show where they were doing some 
comedy skit, and they were specifically talking about the environment and climate change. And you know, they have one of their comedians sit down with like an expert, and the guy was explaining something to the effect of the reason we don't do anything about it, or what gets in the way of us, is what he called, I guess, caveman brain. I don't know exactly mm -hmm. what that was talking about, except for the fact that they had a visual of the comedian coming up and running up against like a lion, and that the response is, "This is a lion, and I must do something." And he takes his club and he tries to, you know, he fights, he hides, he runs, all of those things. And then they show the same caveman coming up against we large melting ice cubes. You know, in a lot of ways, it's far too abstract, right? And so my question is, what you left us with with our, our hands on the lever, we can make it worse, we can make it better going into the future. What is it that you think keeps us from being able to see it? Is it just that it's so darn abstract? Or is there something else? And what do you think would make us, what makes us move? Well, I mean, it's it's um it's a really complicated story. Um, you know, personally, I think that the abstraction has been a problem for a while, in part because the storytelling was conducted in that mode. We heard a lot about climate change as a distant threat, distant in time and in place. Um, you know, it was something that was going to be affecting our grandchildren at the earliest, and maybe centuries down the road, which enabled you to think that. We had a lot of time to grow our way out of it, to invent our way out of it, um, to innovate politically our way out of it. And that's just, you know, misleading uh, science. I mean, the truth is, climate change is already here. There was a um, study that came out last week or the week before showing that many countries in the developing world have already lost as much as 30% of potential P GDP growth over recent decades because of climate change. Um, and when you see the extreme heat waves that we saw last summer, unprecedented global heat waves, hurricane after hurricane hitting um, in the Caribbean, you know, Houston has had three 500-year storms in three years, um, and the wildfires here in California um, last year was a record year. The year before was they had the worst, most destructive wildfire in California history. Um, and depending on who you ask, um, scientists expect that fires are going to get at least twice and perhaps four times as bad just by mid-century. Um, I think that extreme weather is already showing us that climate change is here and it's not abstract, it's right in your face. The wildfires, I think, have been an especially vivid teaching tool on that point because I think people, no matter where they are in the world, actually have a hard time turning away from those images. They seem incredibly intimate, incredibly immediate. Even if you don't live near any brush or forest that could catch on fire, you see someone's house burning down, um, and a, or a whole town's house, a whole town full of houses burning down. It's hard to um, it's hard to uh, turn away from that and not take it seriously. Um, but there are also many obstacles um, to action, even if you do understand that, this, that the um, climate change is here and threatening now. And I think. Um, those obstacles work at every level. I think there is some truth to a kind of caveman brain explanation. I think we have many impulses as individuals to look away from scared stories, to um, be more optimistic. And I think it's a real problem that we anchor our expectations for the future based on our experience of the present. So every time we look out the window, every time we walk outside, we are reminded that the world as it is today is relatively livable. There are people suffering, you know, for sure. But in general, um, things are okay. And we build our model of the future off of that basis. And it's just not a good model because no matter what we do, you know, the UN says we need to mo uh, mobilize at the scale of World War II um, against climate in order to avoid two degrees of warming. Um, even if we did that, we would still end up at about two degrees. Um, we're very far from doing that. And that means that there's almost twi inevitably about twice as much warming um, to come as we've seen to this point. So basing your expectations on the world as it is today is just not a good model for the future. And that's just one of many, many cognitive biases and psychological reflexes that push us away from taking seriously the threat. But there's also the problem of our politics, which is, um, has been quite inert on many fronts, but maybe especially so on climate for a very long time. And I think that that is in part a reflection of this longstanding economic conventional wisdom, which held that um, it was expensive to innovate on climate, to take action on climate, because it would require massive upfront investment and some foregoing of economic growth. 
thankfully, that conventional wisdom has been reversed quite dramatically in the last few years, where most economists now believe we'll be better off economically if we decarbonize faster. And at the individual level, there are huge, huge growth opportunities there, business opportunities there, because if you think about what is necessary to um, avoid catastrophic warming, it's not just the energy sector, it's transportation, it's um, infrastructure, it's agriculture and diet, um, it's really absolutely everything about modern life. And each of those sectors requires um, massive, massive innovation to get us where we need to go. Each of them contains probably thousands of fortunes to be had. Um, if, we, if we need to you know, completely change all of these um, aspects of our life in order to avert some of these worst case scenarios, it's not just like one silver bullet technology that's gonna save us all. There are thousands that need to be brought into being, and each of those are an opportunity as well. And then there's the, um, the sort of geopolitical challenge, which I personally find most difficult to solve because you know I'm a, I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up in the 90s. Um, and in a certain way, I really think of myself as a kind of end of history kid. I would have argued with you as a teenager if you told me that um, you know history was a neat line of progress and globalization was a pure force for good and markets were always productive. I knew that there were problems with each of those narratives. And yet, that was my basic emotional uh, posture towards the world, that over time, things would get better, there would be more prosperity in the world, there would be more peace in the world, and outcomes would be more just and equal, um, and more cooperation. And I expected that that, would, that story would unfold over my lifetime. I now feel quite differently about that. Um, you know, the Paris Accords were established very much in that spirit. It was a kind of a, maybe a last gasp of the um, post-World War II international order trying to work. And no major industrial nation in the world is on track to meet its commitments under Paris. Mm -hmm. Even if all of them did, we would still land north of three degrees of warming, which would mean all of the biggest cities in the Middle East and South Asia would become basically unlivable in summer. It would mean as many as um, 200 million, possibly as many as a billion climate refugees, according to the UN. Um, a billion is as many people as live in North and South America combined. I think those numbers are high, uh, too high, but they give you a sense of just how dramatic these impacts would be, even if all of the nations of the world honored the Paris commitments, which none of them are. Um, we're just three years in, and already that the, the um, model of cooperation that was encoded in that agreement is, is failing, and we're seeing at a time when you'd want to believe the world's nations were coming together to face a truly international, global, existential threat. Instead, we're seeing so many nations of the world retreating into nativism and self-interest and nationalism. And on the one hand, that may not be a surprise. If you were to project what a politics in a time of resource scarcity and huge migration would look like, it would probably be exactly that, which means I can't say that we won't see more people like Donald Trump and Jair Bolsonaro um, emerging on the world stage over the next decade or two as climate change becomes a more important driver of our geopolitics and our politics. But um, I also want to believe that there is an opportunity for some kind of cooperation going forward because if we don't cooperate, if we let every nation work entirely on their own instinct and out of their own sense of self-interest, um, action on climate will be much, much harder. Even if all the nations, of, leaders of the nations of the world agree that this is a pressing crisis, which I think at this point actually almost all of them do, individual nations are really incentivized to slow walk action and let the rest of the world clean up the mess. Um, and that means that you're gonna have more outcomes exactly as we've seen with Paris, where everybody is rhetorically committed to the problem, but when they, it comes, when the rubber hits the road, they're doing much, much less than they need to um, and hoping that it'll be someone else's problem problem with that is that it's everybody's problem. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I said earlier, it's also important to keep in mind the kind of climate equity, uh, climate, climate inequality part of the story, that some nations will be hit much, much harder. Um, but all nations will be impacted in some way. And you know, if, if the US is comforted or if Russia is comforted by thinking that of all the nations in the world will be suffering among the least, that's not good. <laughs> um, we want, to, we want to be motivated by the well-being of the planet as a whole, but also to think we can secure a better future for our nation, too, if we take action quickly. Um, so, you know, we'll see how that all plays out. I, I think the last few years don't give much reason for 
hope. But then again, um, you know, if you had said to somebody living in Europe in the 1920s, 1930s, that we're going to have a lib an international order that presides for 50 years built on the principle of human rights, where nations will go to war because someone has violated someone's human rights, they would have laughed at you too. And I think that we will likely see a kind of new international order emerging over the next decades that really does put climate issues front and center in much the way that human rights, at least rhetorically, was the center of the liberal international order that presided over, over the last now 60, 70 years. Um, and I think you see some nations of the world already waking up to that when you see um, MBS, you know, this in many ways kind of atrocious leader of um, Saudi Arabia, uh, saying that he needs his country's economy to be entirely off oil by 2050 and mostly off oil by 2030. It contains an insight that you won't be able to produce these fossil fuels much longer and still expect the seat at the table of nations, that you will be uh, kind of an outcast in the same way that someone who um, runs roughshod over human rights is today an outcast of those, of those in, a, in that community. Um, now, do I think that 30 years from now, if someone like Jair Bolsonaro came to power promising to deforest the Amazon, that like the US and China would go to war to take him out of office? Maybe not, but it actually doesn't seem um, preposterous to imagine. I think that's how totally our geopolitics will be remade by this force, which really promises to remake every aspect of our lives going forward. And that's really um, the part of the book that most excites me is not the question of science and walking through exactly what the heat impacts will be and the flooding will be, et cetera, et cetera. It's these humanitarian impacts. It's these questions of humanities. Um, what will a politics in a time of climate change look like? What will a culture in a time of climate change look like? And I think we're really entering into a new era that will be defined by climate in much the same way that you would have said the 19th century was defined by modernity or the late 20th by financial capitalism. That's how profound, epic a story it is that we're talking about. And we, we're all protagonists in that story, which is another kind of exciting, interesting part of it. It's interesting because the piece that you said is like the most interesting to you is my very last question, which is just you spend the first half of your book talking about the science of it, and then you talk about the impact on you know the the how it will disrupt our democracy, how it will uh, exacerbate uh, racial and income inequalities, how all of these different pieces. So just at a very high level, because I want to kind of get to some of these questions, is just that question of, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I think we're in California, that's like huge in terms of what we're delving into, these issues of inequities and economic um, and otherwise in terms of making sure that people have the ability to thrive. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mentioned sort of the, the global inequality picture, which is some nations are going to be hit much harder than others. Um, and in general, that's a portrait of the global south, the global poor being hit harder than the global north. Um, that holds true in almost all ways, actually. That's also true within nations. So it's the poor nations, but the poor regions of a country that tend to be hit hardest. So in the US, um, that's largely the southeast. Um, but it also holds true even at the level of local communities, where, you know, for instance, in the floodplains of Houston, it's not the, you know, the oil barons of Texas that are living in the most vulnerable areas. It's um, the working poor. And um, that's true nearly everywhere in the country. Um, it's also true that the wealthy have the ability to protect and defend themselves. You know, in California, um, about a third of Cal Fire's fire firefighting force are um, inmates that have been brought out of prison to fight fires for pay of a dollar a day. And yet, um, the wealthiest people in Malibu can hire private fire fighting forces to protect their homes in the face of fire. Um, not everyone can do that. <laughs> um, and that's, um, that sort of dynamic plays out with nearly every impact. So, you know, public health issues, um, mosquitoes that used to really only fly through the tropics are now probably going to be flying as far north as the Arctic in the next few decades. And how, how we respond to that will play out on, along a differential of class as well. You know, it means one thing for me to contract malaria and another thing for someone who doesn't have any health insurance to contract malaria. Um, and, you know, agriculture, um, same way. You know, the, the, um, the, the, the wealthier um, landowners and, and corporate uh, farm conglomerates will be able to adapt and respond in ways that smaller scale um, farmers or 
brother on food will be able to. Um, and in that way, it's a really um, dispiriting portrait of the future, which is, um, you know, intensifying and exacerbating the things that we all basically agree are the worst features of our um, current world, um, and which may simultaneously be, um, you know, uh, diminishing our capacity to respond. You know, if our um, economic growth is as significantly impacted as most economists predict it will be, um, that means that we'll have less wealth to deploy. Um, probably we will be more interested in deploying that wealth um, closer to home because humans being who they are, they're, you know, Californians are more interested in protecting their homes from wildfire than in building a seawall to protect Bangladesh. Um, and unfortunately, the smaller our, not just the smaller our economic pie is, but the stronger our intuitions of resource scarcity are, um, the less likely I think we're going to be to support some of the necessary um, tools of mitigation and adaptation that will be required to protect communities elsewhere that are suffering. Um, and these are not just like, you know, this one neighborhood or this that one neighborhood. In the case of Bangladesh, I mean, it's, we're talking about a whole civilization. Um, India, even more dramatically. Um, and if those regions become something close to uninhabitable over the course of a century, those are major, major losses to um, the heritage of the planet. Now, I don't think that we'll get to a place where like, there won't be a single human living in all of India. I think that's a wildly apocalyptic picture. But um, there may be population centers that get dramatically smaller. Um, there may be you know, floodplains that used to be quite prosperous centers of agricultural um, activity that no longer can support it. Um, and the coastlines of those countries will be dr redrawn quite dramatically. Um, you know, it'll be a very, very different world. And if we want to stop that world from happening, it will require much more commitment on the part of the world's wealthy to innovate and um, especially uh, sort of focus their um, humanitarian efforts on the needs of those most in need. <laughs> I want to get through as many of these questions as I can. And so to that end, there are a lot of really good ones. Um, so if I can ask you where it's possible based on the question. Let's go short. If you can do yeah. like a minute on it. Sorry, I don't mean to be solemn with it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, it's all amazingly important and great stuff. I just it's just all, it, the, the really interesting thing is it's all so connected. So it's, you know, it's hard to talk about one particular chair falling apart. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm okay. So, um, <laughs> if I can. It's hard to like, it's, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll be extremely um, quick, but in general, it's like, the more you oh, know, the more it's all connected. Yeah, which no, 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 is, I yeah. completely get that, and I think people are interested in hearing these answers. So we'll start with this one, which is, this individual says, we face three systems uh, crises today. Climate, capitalism, democracy. How do you see these as connected? Um, in a minute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that simple. <laughs> you know, um, I think, I, I think I explained a little bit the connection between climate and, and politics, which is to say that it's already, I think, introducing a sense of resource scarcity and competition in a way that's really damaging. Um, the relationship between capitalism and climate change, I think, is probably intuitive. But in general, we've had, we have a system that has really prioritized um, uh, economic growth built on fossil fuels for several centuries now and um, is incentivized to continue that practice. Um, you know, the going forward, though, I'm not, um, I'm not someone who wants to personally upend the whole apple cart of capitalism to solve the, the climate crisis. I think, you know, there are countries in the world that are considerably to the left of the U.S. Um, that are behaving considerably worse on um, carbon emissions than we are. Um, and I think that, frankly, there are a lot of, there's a lot of market energy to be harnessed in the solution. Um, when you look at how much progress renewables have made in the U.S., it's been quite astonishing over the last decade or two. Um, but I think we understand, not just on climate, but in general looking at our political economy, that we can't um, behave as though a completely hands-off approach to the market will solve all of our problems. We need to intervene in ways beyond um, letting market forces do their work. And I think that's especially true on climate, where we've responded to this um, incredible progress on renewables, not by retiring dirty energy sources, but by simply expanding our energy capacity so that um, 
the purport globally, the proportion of renewable to dirty energy has not grown at all over 40 years, even though um, our renewable capacity has expanded enormously and gotten much cheaper. Um, we need some more directed um, public uh, policy and regulation to make sure that the gains that are made in the areas where we can innovate dramatically are actually helping the problem rather than just um, you know, pushing us farther down the path. What countries or companies are currently mounting the most effective responses to climate change? Um, well, companies, I mean, I, I, I happen to be a, you know, an enormous admirer of Elon Musk, um, who gets you know, a ton of bad press these days. But I think that um, you know, not just Tesla, but SolarCity are enormously important um, parts of this story. I actually wish that there was considerably more innovation in Silicon Valley generally focused on, um, on climate change. I think that um, we need to think of you know, tech innovation as you know, something that happens well beyond um, programming, as something that involves new kinds of infrastructure and new kinds of transportation. And the more that we can channel the capital and sort of um, talent that's in um, you know, the valley to those kinds of um, problems and projects, I think the better off we'll be. You know, in terms of countries, honestly, there are not many who are doing great. <laughs> there are, um, everybody's emissions, um, globally our emissions are going up. There are some countries whose emissions are going down, but they're not going down nearly fast enough to even keep up with the Paris requirements. You know, I'm heartened that yesterday or the day before, the British Parliament declared a climate emergency came down with a plan to get to zero emissions by 2050, quite serious plan, um, a plan that Indi the government of Indonesia put forward a couple of weeks ago I found really exciting. This is a country that has doubled its per capita income over the last 20 years, it's halved its poverty rate, but as with many countries in the developing world that have done that exactly, they did it by industrializing, which means that they double their carbon emissions. But they say that they can have their carbon emissions by 2030, which would put them ahead of their commitments under Paris and still continue to grow at 6% per year, which is actually faster than the 5% per year that they had been growing on. So there is this new economic um, wisdom that is um, developing and, and sort of percolating up into the minds of policymakers the world over, that we don't need to choose between prosperity and climate responsibility. We can choose a path that allows us both. It's especially exciting to see a country in the developing world make that choice because for a long time it seemed as though we were gonna be asking countries like that to forego middle classness and ask their people to continue to stay poor for the sake of the health of the planet. And that was a really morally complicated ask to be making um, as you know, nations of the West that had benefited from the burning of fossil fuels for several centuries. But I do think that that's changing. I think it's changing fast enough. And I don't think those policies are yet in place. But hopefully over the next year or two, we'll see more of it in the US, uh, maybe especially. It's really sort of exciting and um, interesting to see the war of ideas competition in the Democratic Party, in the Democratic primary over climate, and um, we'll see how that all plays out, but at least we're arguing over these things now, which is much better than we were doing five years ago. Isn't population a crucial issue? I was born into two billion, uh, a population of two billion. Um, now there's almost eight billion, increasing by 80 million per year. Doesn't this have to be confronted? Well, I think um, you know every new person who walks the planet walks it with carbon footprint. So um, yes, there is an impact. Every new life has some cost. Um, but you know, demographers believe that the planet's population will peak um, probably uh, towards the end of this century or early next century, around 10 or 11 billion. And they think that the planet has the resources to support that um, population if we manage that development properly. The question is ultimately how we organize those lives how we supply energy to them, how we, you know, how those people do business and travel and eat. And um, if we can get all those questions right, the population question um, becomes much less pressing. Um, but, you know, um, we need to because we are going to be adding those people. Um, and if we don't get those questions right, many, many, many of them will be suffering because most of the um, population growth is actually scheduled to take place in parts of the world that are going to be hit hardest by warming, um, Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. When you say it's in our hands, can you speak to whose hands specifically? And this person's asking, like, the collective versus people in power slash policy. And they underline policy, so I think they're asking, like, yeah. 
I, for me, policy is the whole story. I mean, this is, the challenge is so big that we can't possibly address it through individual action alone, even large scale organized action. Um, that is especially clear to me, I think, when you realize that we don't just need to reduce our carbon emissions, we need to zero them out. Because if we continue to produce any carbon, the planet will continue to get warmer. It may get warmer at a slower rate, and at the, in the present day, we could probably afford a little bit of warming without things getting too catastrophic. But if we're at two and a half or three degrees, even adding a little bit of carbon is gonna continue making the things considerably worse. So we need to zero, the UN says we need to zero out on carbon by 2050. Um, in order to do that, we need public policy. It's the only way to you know, remake our infrastructure. It's the only way to remake our transportation systems. Um, you know, I don't think that if everyone in this room never flew again, if everyone, everyone in this room knew never flew again, if every American never flew again, there would still be hundreds of millions of people elsewhere in the world who wanted to fly, which means if we need to have a zero carbon transportation sector, that means we need to have zero carbon planes, we need to have electric planes, um, and that will require significant R&D, because we're quite far from that now, probably so significant that it will require public subsidy, and also meaningful um, legislation and regulation that will require airline manufacturers to be building those kinds of planes and airlines to be flying them. Same is true at the level of diet. You hear a lot about how people, um, how you can reduce your carbon footprint by eating less red meat. That's true. But, you know, again, there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who are, or you know, billions of people in the world who are um, not want to not want, not going to want to go vegan. Um, and it's also the case that, you know, small scale studies have shown that if you feed seaweed to cattle, their methane emissions fall by 95 or 99%. So if we could conceivably, if that study held up, those studies held up, and we could legislate that every single cattle farmer had to feed their cows some small amounts of seaweed, then we wouldn't have to be, we wouldn't have to talk about um, what you ate, you know, what choices you were making on your dinner plate because the problem would be solved before it even got to you. And that's the great gift of public policy is that we can, um, rather than asking individuals to make choices that range from irresponsible and climate to responsible, we can basically ensure that they're making choices between a variety of options, each of which are responsible. Um, and ultimately, it's a sign of just how big, dramatic, urgent this crisis is that it can only be, be uh, addressed through policy. So for me, it's, it's, it's all politics and policy. There's the individual choices stuff is um, you know, marginal at best. Bringing the carbon levels in the atmosphere to the current levels took many people's combined action over many generations. In contrast, it appears that some mitigating actions could be undertaken in an afternoon by a single individual, like launching shady particles into the atmosphere. This could also lead to a lack of coordination and applying these approaches. Thoughts, comments? Yeah, I mean, personally, I'm more inclined to hope for and push for solutions and that, um, our, that are collectively managed rather than um, kind of rogue. Um, projects, and I suspect that if we see something like solar geoengineering, which is I think the, um, the technology that's being referred to, uh, which is basically suspending particles probably of sulfur into the atmosphere to reflect some sunlight back to sun the sun, so the earth is a little cooler than it would be otherwise, I suspect that that is, while it is conceivably possible that a single person could do it um, with a few billion dollars, um, I think it's more likely that um, a a nation or set of nations that are not um, not working through an international framework but operating on their own would do it. And I think that's dangerous in part because those impacts could be um, distributed unequally so that, you know, for instance, you could um, preserve some um, the, you could preserve some of the uh, viability of agricultural land in Russia without doing much to help the people who are um, suffering in, in Bangladesh or Sub-Saharan Africa or something. Um, for that reason, I, I hope for a more um, coordinated global response, but I do think that um, the math is such that we do need some kind of external drivers. We're not going to be able to decarbonize fast enough to make um, to arrive at a, a climate that you and I and everyone in this room would recognize was um, prosperous and fulfilling and habitable um, for everyone in the world. And so I think we are going to have to bring in some other solution. Geoengineering is one of those solutions. There's also carbon capture, which takes carbon out of the atmosphere, um, which I have more hope for. And um, other solutions having, you know, there are many, many kind of exciting but also kind of crazy seeming ideas um, that are really at the, at the very laboratory stage. My hope is that 
Um, well, first of all, I think we'll be moving forward with a huge constellation of them rather than just a single one. I think it, it's another reflection of the size of the crisis that we won't be able to address it with just a single solution. But also, I hope that when we do move forward with them, it's through coordinated action rather than um, rogue action. Because if it's you know if it's individuals or individual nations, um, the great power dynamics there get really complicated, which is to say, really ugly quite soon. So my last question is related to, I think, a conversation you and I had related to California wildfires, right? So last year, a substantial part of the state was on fire, right? And so I remember thinking about uh, people who were talking about they were going to go on you know, Amazon and get their $800 air filter, or people who were tweeting or putting on Facebook that they were going to head to their, you know, their summer home or fly to meet a friend. or I should even say it, it left, lifted up for me the huge discrepancy between the haves and the have nots. There are plenty of people who had no ability to, let alone fly somewhere, to even just get one of those masks if you're living, um, so you don't have a home, right? So I'm going to read some words that I heard you said, and then I'm going to ask you what we should all do about it. So you said, if I'm not mistaken, we have an incredible ability to normalize a grotesque amount of suffering. So if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about that and then finishing it with a call to action for uh, us. Like, yeah. how do we do better? I mean, the, 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 story, the story that I tell to illustrate that is, um, you know, there's this study that I write about in the book which um, looked at the, the difference just between 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and 2 degrees of warming, um, just through the effect of air pollution, which is not exactly a result of climate change, but is produced basically by the same thing that produces climate change, which is the burning of fossil fuels. And just that half degree of warming, just through air pollution, the study found would um, kill an additional 153 million people. When I say that, um, you know, to a, an individual I'm talking to, to a group of people, you know, I see their eyes widen, and like, yeah, their faces go ashen. It's horrifying. It's death and suffering at the scale of 25 holocausts. And we think, how could you possibly conscience that? It's unconscionable, which it is. But 9 million people are dying already each year from air pollution. And we're not really focused on that at all. <laughs> um, and I think the same is true with wildfires. I mean, I've I'm, I'm actually been reporting a story about wildfires, which is very closely on the subject. I went to California to report on it and felt, as a New Yorker, I don't understand how anybody could live in, like, you know, Malibu uh, after. I met a woman in Malibu who lived, lived through nine fires. And I'm just like, well, how could you possibly do that? Um, and I expected to see a state that was like, and in particular, I was working around LA. Um, reckoning with what a completely different climate future would look like. Mm -hmm. But actually, um, what I found was that people had already, six months after these unbelievably catastrophic fires, had already totally adjusted their expectations. And we're talking in quite practical terms about the real estate implications um, and what they had to do to their lawns and what they had to do with to their homes. Um, they were not thinking, this is a world that we can never live in. This is an environment we can't live in. Nature is trying to tell us something. We need to change course dramatically. They were thinking, what are the marginal adjustments I can make to my life to make it marginally more habitable? Um, and I think ultimately, that's how we've all been trained to think. Um, and we need to think really differently. Um, the challenge is much bigger than that. Um, it requires a complete remaking of our energy sector, our infrastructure, our transportation systems, and our agriculture, our diet. Um, in many ways it changes, it, it requires change of our culture. Um, and this is a quite profound challenge. We don't have much time to do it if we want to avoid some really terrifying outcomes. Um, and whatever happens, climate change will have completely remade the planet. Because even if we engage in such a large scale mobilization that we avoid some of these worst case outcomes, it will mean 
There are many huge plantations of solar panels. There are huge plantations for carbon capture machines that our transportation looks completely different, that our infrastructure looks completely different. The way we eat, the way we produce our food will be completely different. Um, so even if we solve the problem, we will be living in a world that is completely transformed by the force of climate change. And we need to understand that as an opportunity to build a new world that will be equitable and prosperous and fulfilling and just, rather than one in which only those who have the most can secure their own lives and livelihoods. And if we take for granted that a complete transformation of the world is inevitable, and what we're doing is really choosing between designing that world ourselves or letting nature with its retributive power um, make that world for us. To me, the choice is clear. The incentives are really clear. And um, there's no excuse for not taking the more productive path, especially because, you know, if we don't, I think our children and grandchildren really won't forgive us. OK. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending uh, your lunch time with us. Um, let me know if this is true, that you might be willing to take up you kind of come with it. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. absolutely. Um, and uh, if you didn't know that these books